So the judge throwing the book at Danny Welty today. Uh, life in prison and uh, another 10 years on top of that. So um, there'll be some parole eligibility. We'll talk about that in a minute. But the bottom line here is the judge uh, was, was not buying it and was not giving uh, Danny Welty any bit of a break in this case whatsoever. Let's bring in our think tank to talk about this one. And let's, of course, begin with uh, Kimberly Bandell, former judge. I mean, a judge has a lot of a lot of discretion in this one. It was second-degree murder. Shot her in the back of the head as she was fleeing. Uh, before, uh, as, as she was getting away, uh, a third person tried to intervene to stop him. He had gone back to get his gun. At the end of the day, judge gave him life, uh, Kimberly. Your thoughts, your reaction? I, I think... Appropriate. I think that that was an appropriate sentence given a factual scenario. I was especially appalled at the part where he actually moved a bystander to the side to actually shoot and kill her. So there was like a moment of intervention where he could have had a moment of come to and like snap out of whatever rage he was in and he chose to pursue it. And so I think that that sentence was definitely appropriate for what he did. Jennifer Brandt, you know, the underlying uh, story here uh, of Danny Welty and, and part of what they're talking about is that, you know, their son had taken his life. They had buried him that day, that somehow that is some mitigating factor. I see that as an aggravating factor because this son is buried and now you take the life of another member of that family. Um, and then you've got Bethany, the, the daughter. She, I mean, her world's just falling apart. Uh, this was horrific, absolutely horrific and tragic. Uh, what do you think about the life in prison? I agree. I think it was the appropriate sentence. Um, you know, it, there's so much anger here, apparently. Uh, they were going through a divorce. Who knows if he blamed his wife for any of this, you know, what happened to the son or whatever. But, I mean, this was a, a tragic event on a tragic day. I mean, these people had just attended the funeral for their very own son. And then for him to snap like that and go after her. And as we as we heard, I mean, he didn't just it wasn't passion, although that's what they're saying it is. But he stopped. Someone intervened and then he couldn't get the gun to work, apparently, and shot her a number of times. So he really meant to do this. Um, and although I understand he's, uh, you know, his attorney said he doesn't have a bad bone in his body and he's done some good things in prison. Still, what he did to this family, horrific. And what he did to his wife, obviously, awful. And I mean, there's just no going back on that. I, unfortunately, you know, this is, he got the sentence, I believe, that he really deserves. And if he can turn his life around and, and do some good, maybe he can in prison. But, um, for this this family, there's no going back. And you even hear his daughter, you know, testifying about that she believes that that was an appropriate sentence. So when you hear that, I mean, what other choice could the judge really make? Yeah, I, I wish I was in court for that argument, not an evil bone in his body. I, I would say, you know, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not a doctor, or Your Honor, I'm not a doctor, but um, I think there are several bones in, in the hand that was holding the gun that he used to shoot his when wife in the back that, of the head. That was awful just yeah. to hear that. I agree. All right. Matt Wilson was the prosecutor in the case, and we spoke to him, uh, and he explained the parole eligibility because it was second degree. So he is going to be eligible for parole at some point. Let's take a listen. Under Missouri law, he'll have to do 85% of that uh, life sentence. And in Missouri, that life sentence carries at least uh, uh, 30 years. And so he'll do 85% of that. And then he also got a 10-year sentence on top of that for the armed criminal action. And he'll have to do 85% of that as well. Um, and, and that's a consecutive sentence to the, the life sentence. And so he will be eligible for parole. Rough numbers, and again, these are just rough, is anywhere from, from about 28 to 30-some years uh, until he's eligible for parole. Joseph Lowe sounds reasonable to me. As a, a man in his mid to late 70s, he'll be able to uh, go before that parole board and maybe get a second chance. Well, I don't know if you'll even make it that far. That's a long time to spend, but I'd say this. Many folks in this country have been through a divorce, and it is quite common experience to understand how your former spouse can say some of the ugliest, most hurtful 
uh, cutting you to the bone type of comments. I mean, just horrible things that they can say. That our spouses have great power over us, especially during this time. But then when you combine it with the fact that now they had a son who, when learning of the divorce at age 17, is so distraught that he calls a mama on the phone and says, I'm about to kill myself with a gun. And then hearing this, she rushes over to his house to try and save him or stop him. And can you imagine what she must have felt when she came in and she found him that way, dead from a gunshot wound, which visually is horrible? This causes, seeing these things, emotional trauma, severe emotional trauma, as our psychological experts will tell you. It's called PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. And it is an injury that stays with people for life. All you have to do is look at the combat that you come home from seeing horrible things and the treatment they have to undergo just to try and, and cope with it. But now you throw that on the day of a funeral where emotions are running high, people are in despair, denial, they are mad at themselves, they are feeling guilty, and they will say sometimes the worst things. And you can see a scenario where a husband is out there pleading or otherwise arguing with his former spouse, and something ugly is said, as if she had taken a club out of the car and swung it towards him. And if he had shot her in that act, we would say he was justified. But when you say something so ugly and so disgusting that it hurts someone soft and, if you will, uh, nice, as his lawyer says uh, Mr. Wealthy was, it would cut him to the bone and it would make him arguably temporarily insane. I mean, it's as if, Vinny, I went to the funeral and I started saying ugly things about the person who was dead to the family and the friends and the other, um, you know, people who, who know him really well. And they'd be justified to pull me off that pulpit and, and, and beat me and, and so forth because you don't say ugly things at a place like that at a time like that. And so what I would have liked to have seen, which I don't know that got done, was to share what it was about this man and what he has to give and what changes he can make that we never got to hear about. Because that person likely was pushed over the cliff and probably has PTSD, which the experts will tell you is a form of a brain injury. And I never got to hear that. When we come back, a poker player goes missing. She's found dead, and now it is a mystery. Her friends speaking out will talk about the disappearance and death of poker player Susie Q when we return.